Hello and welcome along to the RT Rugby Podcast as we head into the final week of the regular season in the BKT United Rugby Championship. Four bonus point wins for the Irish provinces last weekend and that means all four Irish sides will be in the playoffs. Whether or not that's going to be enough for the Champions Cup qualification we won't know pretty much until the end of May when the Challenge Cup and the URC are wrapped up and we know the winners and losers there but... Just to let you know regarding the the Women's Six Nations, we'll have another pod up a little bit later on today. So keep an eye out for that. Michael Glennon will be chatting to Ireland pair Sam Monaghan and Linda Jugang. So listen out for that. For now, though, we'll be looking at the URC. Bernard Jackman and Ian Keatley are with us this week. And Keats, make or break territory now for you with you elbows in the, the AIL. You're into the promotion relegation playoff in, in 2A Sligo this weekend. How are you, you feeling ahead of the semi final? Yeah, good. We've uh, good training session. We've got good performances over the last few weeks, which has kind of led to a bit of confidence going into it. But I've told the lads, it probably wasn't the semi-final final that we wanted at the start of the season. But nonetheless, it's uh, it's two big games. So uh, listen, it's it's knockout rugby. It's going to be tight and tense affairs. But I hope he will come out the, on the right side of the the scoreline this weekend. Yeah, and look, and look, you've been on with us plenty of times over the, the course of the season and you've been keeping us updated on how things are going. In fairness, there was a stage a few months ago when getting into a playoff would have probably seemed like a, a decent result given how the season started. Yeah, exactly. Around Christmas time, I think we would have bit our hands uh, off of being in this situation. It's it's in our own hands. Um, but listen, it's, it's it's good for me as a as a coach to be in a challenging position like this already in my in my coaching career, and I'm I'm learning a lot um, how how I would have done things differently throughout the season, and yeah, it's developing. But it's it's all about the players, and I just hope for their sake that uh, we can perform on the weekend and uh, show a good account of ourselves. Very good. Well, best of luck this weekend, and uh, hopefully the week after as well. Um, <laughs> yeah. Birch, if if we don't the, win, I won't be on next week. <laughs> Birch, looking at the looking at the URC, as I said, with four good wins for the Irish provinces at the weekend. Normally, I'll kind of lead us off in one direction at the start. I'm going to hand this one over to you. What team are we going to talk about first up this week? Yeah, we have to talk about Munster. Um, I thought it was outstanding. Uh, it was kind of the performance I hoped they would have given in the Sharks in the Champions Cup, and and when they didn't, you know, get that right, I was worried about their ability to to do it, but. Um, I think for round three, Prendergast, Leamy, they'll just take so much heart from that. Obviously, getting five points, um, was huge. You know, um, you know, win was one thing, but to get the bonus point, and now they're, in, obviously, they've nailed down the the playoff position. Um, and now it's just a case of making sure that they get, you know, as high as possible and, and get that Champions Cup, um, spot and seeding, etc. So a real turnaround, and, and you know, it wasn't just. It was Crowley. It was you know Healy coming off the bench. You know the the selection decision to to go without Joey, which obviously is a hard decision to make when Joey's staying and and Ben Healy's leaving. Um, but it paid off uh, massively. And Archer as well. You know, uh, I was worried about the Munster scrum. I thought Archer came in did a cracking job. Pete was as usual top end. Coombs had a big game. Uh, you know the second row combination of Klein and, and Snyman uh, looked like a. a partnership that you could build a team around so so many positives for for Munster you know Daly's try off that mall which you know a lot of teams see that space that against the Stormers who are very much a, a blitz defense but they had a skill set to execute it um, and that's been coming that's been worked on so yeah so many positives for from Munster point of view from either the team of the week yeah and it's funny you kind of said at the, the start of your answer you took the first line out of my notes that this was the exact prediction you had for the Sharks game a couple of weeks ago. Very much the, like, Munster need a response, Munster tend to get a response. And look, it, it happened a few weeks late, but ultimately it was it was exactly that. They were backed into a corner. I'll be straight up and say, I like, I was chatting to my brother at home in Limerick on Saturday afternoon. He texted me before the, the Munster match saying he had a sneaky feeling they were going to catch the Stormers on the hop. And to be honest, I can... I'll be totally honest and say I said I, I replied to him saying can't see it happening. I think it actually could be a pretty bad day. Um, I'm happy enough to eat my words on that one, Keith, because they were they were absolutely outstanding and had to to ride a tricky spell in probably the middle third of the game, hold out in the the third quarter, and in the end it was a it was a two point win, twenty six twenty four. But that probably flatters the Stormers given how Gavin Coombs's try basically won the match for Munster with with a few minutes to spare. 
If you're not realised now, you don't never uh, rule out months in here. Come on, <laughs> how many times have they done this? Uh, but yeah, no. Listen, it was it was a great it was a great win. They almost beat uh, the Stormers at their own game. Like they scored two mall tries. Um, Shane Daly's try came from a mall advantage where they could play it out wide, and um, it's just a really good performance. And uh, you touched on there is is Audrey Simon's um, second like. His first game against the Sharks. That that was his first game. He didn't look up to, like ready for for a start, but this is, was only his second start, and you could see he was kind of getting back to his best. He was winning collisions. He was throwing his one handed offloads, keeping the the game alive. And um, big b- big games from the other guys that we just talked about there, from from Pete, John Klein, Stephen Archer, Dermot Barron with, with two two mall tries, and and then the backs did really well to finish it. Um, and beating the Stormers at home, I think they've unbeat. They've been unbeaten there for two years. I think two or three years. Got like to, that's yeah, got to two years. Got to two years. Like that's that's incredible, and it's it's great for Munster now going into this next. It, it builds nice momentum now. If they can get another uh, win against the Sharks on the weekend, it looks like they could be playing Glasgow in Glasgow, um, where I think they're gonna have. A, <laughs> Uh, they're going to have a niggle in that match as well. There's always niggle in, in those Glasgow matches, but especially after Glasgow kind of beat them in Tomlin Park there a few weeks ago, I, that's going to be some match that's going to um, going to take place there if, if it comes to that. Yeah, and Birch, on the on the Stormers win is a, to to stay on that. One of the things you, you know yourself and Eddie were were chatting to to me last week about. We were talking about Monsters' defense and how it has been all over the place for for a you know the last three three and a half games leading up to this but if you were looking back at the the Stormers match and the Stormers who are a team who are, who can absolutely cut sides apart and we saw them do it to Leinster a couple of times as well a few weeks ago but granted they scored four tries one of them was when the game was over realistically but the other three it wasn't a case of Munster really being cut open or or ripped apart like the Stormers had to really really work for them and they were you know there were scores coming off a lot of pressure where eventually they got over. It wasn't a case of what we'd seen with Munster in the last few weeks where sides weren't really having to work too hard for their scores. Yeah, no, it was it was back to... I actually, you know, me and Eddie disagreed. Eddie and I disagreed on this because he... I thought Leamy had done a very good job with, with Munster's defence and um, this season. And statistically, they were they were one of the better teams in the competition. And obviously, that blowout in the second half against the Scarlets, the Glasgow performance, the Sharks away in the Champions Cup, and you wondered, you know, was that going to be their downfall, you know, um, leading into this this really important period for them? But they'd be so happy with how they got back on track. And look, it started with probably their breakdown work in, in terms of slowing down the, the ball. They made really good decisions around, you know, when to contest, how much pressure they could put on on the referee in terms of, you know, not releasing and, and rolling away and played that brilliantly. And that gave them, you know, an opportunity to get bodies on feet and, and shut down, you know, well, it can be a very dangerous Stormers attack. So they'll get huge, huge, I suppose, confidence from that again, just kind of re- reconfirming that they can defend well. And, and obviously back to the scene of the crime, you know, Durban this weekend. Um, and what a great opportunity it is to show how much they've learned from that and progressed. Yeah. And then on the Sharks game this weekend. So in terms of the Champions Cup, there's there's a load of different kind of permutations here. So top seven ultimately is necessary to get into Champions Cup Munster or fifth at the moment. Top six might be needed. There's the slightest, slightest chance that top five will be needed, but that's highly unlikely. All of this is basically coming down to who wins the Challenge Cup. Is it going to be one of, um, you know, if, are Benetton going to win the Challenge Cup or does an, an eighth place team win the, win the URC? Ultimately, though, Munster know one point against the Sharks this weekend and they have that you know, they have their Champions Cup spot. They can only drop out of the top six if the Bulls beat Leinster with a bonus point and Munster get nothing from the Sharks. So, Keats, looking at this game in Durban this weekend, as Bursch said, back to the the scene of the crime from a few weeks ago. In terms of selection, are you staying largely the same? Orgy Snyman obviously is out with the the concussion, so you'd imagine Finney and Witcherly comes in. As much as possible, are you kind of sticking with the same side? Yeah, I, I think you have to, to build on that momentum. Um, as I said, it was a good all-round performance. Even I, I, I kind of felt this as, as a coach, you, you don't want to change a winning side, especially uh, with, with, with that momentum from the last weekend. And most of that side that played in the weekend, 
probably play most of them played against the Sharks, and I'm sure they want a bit of redemption for for the Champions Cup exit there a few weeks ago. So you won't you won't be changing changing much, and um, yeah, I I can't see them. I, I can't see as I said, it's kind of bad to say. I can't really see Joey getting back in for this week. I think he's going to stick with the with the same with the same team because that's what got them. And I'd say they're going to play quite a similar way to what they did against against the Stormers. They just didn't do that against the Sharks in the first match. Um, so I'd say it'll be a similar enough game plan. And Bart, you, like it leaves Joey Carberry in a very very tricky and strange situation, and not really one that we would have seen a a few months ago where. Not only has he lost his place to to Jack Crowley in in the starting team, but like it would have been a huge blow for him, I would imagine personally, that Ben Healy, who's who's leaving the province in in a few weeks, is getting the nod ahead of him at on the bench. Yeah, look, it'd be very hard to take, and but I think if Joey's starting for Munster and they're playing Champions Cup rugby next year, you know, some of that's down to Ben Healy. To be fair to him, so obviously Roundtree and and his coaching staff saw. You know something in 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 training or Healy's performance in the past to, to believe he had a role to play in how in terms of getting that result in, in the Stormers and and Joey's gonna have to wait his time. It's gonna be a big test for him. Um, obviously a big, you know, in the past when he hasn't been playing, it's been down to injury. To be fair, um, uh, but whenever he's been fit, he's generally been number one for for Munster since he moved down there. Crowley got ahead of him number one, but I think we all expect him to be number two and for that to. For that battle to to continue, um, leading into the World Cup, but you know it is what it is from him, and I think to be honest, if he bounces back from this, he still is a very talented player. Um, I suppose the question mark around him is is that character, that resilience, that ability to drive the team forward. Which, to be fair to Ben Heaney, he's shown, and that's why he's shown for Munster. To be fair, is he a first choice international for Ireland? I'm not sure. Um. But obviously, Scotland and uh, feel that there's there's value in him there, and he can continue to improve. He can be Jack Crowley. Looks like he has that drive. Um, Munster are back in him at the moment. Ireland are back in him, and it's just one of those periods in in Joey's career which all players have, where things aren't really working out for them. Unfortunately for Joey, because of his talent, what he's already achieved, um, the hype around him, the fact that he was moved down there, it's very much in the um uh, in the shop window, you know, and it's very high profile. Whereas, uh, as I said, most players have have had periods where the coach lost faith in them for a while, but um, it's not done in the uh under the spotlight that Joey is, and that's down to his ability. So, I I I think you can bounce back. I think probably looking forward to an off season now and coming back and and, and getting in there. And and to be honest, Jack Crowley's probably going to be gone for that start the pre-season I know the World Cup does, uh, the URC starts a little bit later but it does start while the World Cup's on so you know Joey Carby has a f- phenomenal chance of if he doesn't turn it around before the end of the season of starting next season the number one and not giving anybody um, access to that jersey but obviously it, it must be a dark enough place from the moment yeah I'd say, I'd say yeah, yeah I was yeah. going to say Keith you, you know as well as anyone the, the spotlight <laughs> that's on that position yeah exactly and um, listen he is. He's just going through a, a, a little rough patch. Um, like I kind of said already on this podcast, like the form of Munster probably didn't help Joey as well, and it goes hand in hand. Um, and then Joey lost a bit of confidence. And it, playing at ten, it's it's a confidence position. And you just see Ben Healy. He's uh, decided right. I'm going to move on. But all of a sudden, when he's decided to move on, he's going to play for play for Scotland. He got capped. Um, he's has a fresh start coming. You can just see his confidence coming out now because he he knows that like he, he's he's going somewhere else. He's like, okay, I'm just going to enjoy my next few months here, monster, enjoy the enjoy the running, and you can see that in his performance. So I wouldn't be ruling Joey out. Yeah, okay, he's going through a tough patch, um, but also it, it's kind of good from from um, Graham Roundtree saying that. Listen, I know you're an established international, but I need to go. I need to think about the team first, and I need to put the guys who are performing well. And it kind of puts a little thing out there. It's like, listen, if you're playing well, performing well, it doesn't matter if there's an Irish international there. I, I, I will, I will back you. So, um, it, it it's, it's good by Graham, Graham, and I'm sure he's had those chats with Joey, and I'm sure Joey understands. And as as Birch said there, um, he's got a big preseason, um, and one injury away, he can get back into that World Cup squad. Mm. And just before we finish up on on Munster Birch, Sean O'Brien joining from Exeter. 
good to get some Sean O'Brien's back into the Irish rugby setup. Yeah, exactly. And he's um he's hit form for for Exeter. He was uh he wasn't making the team for Exeter um earlier on in the year, and I think that probably opened up the opportunity for him to look at coming back home. Um and Exeter made a bit of a change. Rob Baxter became more hands on, um and started to pick Sean O'Brien. But I think the deal was already done to go to Munster. So I think Exeter are fired up that they've um they've lost out on him because they can see the talent he has. He was one of those ones that was probably a surprise that Connacht didn't keep him or couldn't keep him. But when you look and see the talent they have with the Faras, the Dailies, the Bundys, the Carl Fords, etc., the Dave Hawkshaws, they were stacked in that position. So um, great to get him back. Great to get him back. He's been really good for Exeter um, over the last month or two. And, uh, you know, Becca Tau is obviously moving on, but they've replaced him with a top-end uh, centre from the Chiefs. Um, but obviously Dan Goggins is left. So, you know, bringing Sean O'Brien back in there um, just gives them, you know, real quality in, in the centre position. Yeah, and kids, kids they've got some kind of interesting options there going into next season where, as you said, Frisch, Nankavell coming in as well, O'Brien, and then you have someone like Scannell or, or even Jack Crowley who's kind of slotted in there. They have they have some interesting and nice options in there to, to work with. It's going to be going to be interesting to see how they, how they use that position. Yeah, it's kind of been a, I wouldn't say a bogey position for Munster, but I know they they really want to try and bring through young. Uh, as I said, I'm working with the the NTS and the the academy guys in Munster, and they're they're really trying to push to to develop a lot more uh, homegrown um, centres, and it's it's a real kind of little gap at the moment. Um, so to bring these these players in, even Sean O'Brien, who's from Ireland, it, it, it it's really good. After losing, obviously, um, Fakatera, Chris Farrell, and Dan Gog, and it is. It is a big, uh, a big change. So, to the way that they're playing, and they do put, um, they've got Roy Scannell there, who's who's such a solid player. He probably just gets a bit overlooked at the moment. Um, but they also put Jack Crowley in there, and they can kind of change the way they play by by who they pick at at that twelve thirteen position. So it, it's it's interesting times. Um, I think it's a great great addition, and um, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to see how Sean O'Brien goes because he's he's a big guy. Yeah, going to be interesting, interesting to see that. So that's uh, Munster away to the Sharks, 5.15 on Saturday evening. Uh, 5.15 Saturday evening. We'll move on to Leinster now, guys. 39-36 winners against the Lions down in Johannesburg. Sam Prendergast penalty in the, the last minute sealing the win. Before we talk about the, the win itself, Birch, the big news of the day obviously came a couple of hours beforehand. Jacques Nienaber is the new Stuart Lancaster at uh, at Leinster. Before we talk about the actual appointment itself, what was your initial reaction when you heard that? I thought it was a phenomenal piece of business, to be honest. Uh, I only got worried about an hour beforehand. Yeah. Um, Leinster are very good at keeping things under wraps. I've, no, I've no idea. I've no idea how they kept it under wraps for so long. If Birch yeah, doesn't know. <laughs> if, Birch, if Birch didn't hear about <laughs> it. No, it was only done the um, deal on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I think it was going to break in South Africa um, yeah. on Saturday, so they were kind of their hand was was forced a little bit. But what a piece of business! Uh, obviously, Munster benefited from from his expertise back in the day. Um, he's now gone had what uh, a World Cup cycle, a two year World Cup cycle, and now a four year World Cup cycle. One as defense coach and and the the, the latest as head coach. Um, and to be able to get you know to be able to get someone of his ability, I think Leinster. If the, if you're being hypercritical of Leinster. Their defense hasn't been at the same level as their attack. Um, and uh, you know, being able to bring somebody, and I, my understanding is he's going to focus on defense. And Goodman is obviously been, is getting promoted, so he's going to take on more of a role attack wise. And, and Leo will tie it all together. So, um, it's a brilliant piece of business. And I think it like it, it'll benefit Irish rugby as well because okay, he doesn't defend the same as Simon Easterby, but um, you're giving the majority of the Irish squad you know, a different type of, of defensive system point of view. And, you know, both Simon needs to be, Simon needs to be going to make a decision, you know, whether he sticks totally what he wants to do or whether they take on the best bits of the Nina Bar system and implement that for Ireland because it is very effective at the international level. Um, and a new voice in the dressing room, a strong voice. You know, it's very hard to replace Stuart Lancaster. Um, and even though it was World Cup, end of World Cup cycle, so there's a lot of good coaches on the market. I think they've probably gone out and got the best guy. You know, Sean Edwards and him for me are the two best defense coaches in the world. Um, 
so to get one of those is uh is, is a very very strong statement by Leinster that um you know they're looking to continue the current current cycle of success they have in terms of winning games obviously you know they have to win trophies but um I think they they were they, they should win at least one trophy this year and hopefully they can win two. And Keith, obviously you played under Nina Abbott at Munster. Tell us a bit about him as first of all as as a coach, what is it that kind of set him apart when himself and Razi were at Munster and you know led to them going back to South Africa and also just him as a as a guy and as a and as a person around the club? He's, he's a great character. Like he's he's actually very funny and when you when you look at good coaches, firstly they they make it they make it so easy. When when he explains defense, he he keeps it so simple for the players. Doesn't overcomplicate it. Just makes it so simple, and also he makes you want to defend. Like it's incredible. You you actually want to defend for for Jack. Um, just the way how he talked about defense. Um, how he got how he got you like energetic about uh defense, and then even like at half time, he come in and he just go, uh, just get better spacings, get off the line. That's it. Like just he just kept it so simple. And you're like, like at halftime, you you'd always remember Jack's points, maybe more so than the attack points, because he was just straight to the point, kept it so simple, and you're like, yeah, okay, fine. They're the they're the things that we need to work on. And 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 that's a sign of one of the best coaches who can make something sound so simple, but a bit so so effective. So it's a it's a great, it's a great um, like as I said, Lencer just they don't rush into these things, they make sure they get the right guys. To get the right guys in with the appointment of Stuart Lancaster, even Goodman coming in, and now Neymar, and yeah, it's just gonna add another strength strength to their bow with if they can improve their defense. And it's probably something that I've kind of looked at in all teams over the last year or two. It's like defensive, it's kind of defensive. It's all, we're always talking about the attack, attack, attack. When a few years ago, we were always talking about like Saracen's defense, Munster's defense, um, and it's kind of gone. The other way, everyone's starting to talk a bit more attack and kind of forgotten about the defense aspect of the game. So it's going to be interesting to see if if um, Jack can get on par that Leinster's defense on par with their attack, and then God, most teams are going to be in trouble then, aren't they? You were nodding your head first there when Keith was talking. His defense has kind of has it kind of largely been ignored a little bit in the last couple of years? Look, it was always ignored in Super Rugby, and that's why you saw so few Super Rugby defence coaches come up and, and do well. Um, it was the be-all and end-all um, for Northern Hemisphere teams come back probably for 10 years until about two years ago, and then it's become massively focused on style of play, ball and play time, high tempo, you know, offloading, because um, that's what players want to play. I still I, I agree with, with uh, Keats, I think a, a good defence coach sells the importance of defence really well and that's why Edwards is brilliant with the French, he has his own way of of communicating his own motivational and, and, and reward system um, which costs him a lot of money, I think he, he gives uh, the, the hit of the match or the defender of the match a, a nice bottle of uh, uh, cognac now, it used to be champagne um, himself on a, on a Tuesday when he does his defensive review and um, just uh, yeah, just motivates the players to want to defend and, and um, but the the way the rules of the game have been changed, it is much harder to defend. To be fair, like the the onus is on attacking rugby and, and the referees um are are focused on implementing a set of laws that have been adapted. Even the fifty twenty two was adapted was brought in to try and make attack easier. So, um, I think it is harder to, to set your stall out and be totally obsessed by defense. But I think. You know what Leinster now have is someone whose job is fifty percent of the time uh, to make sure they're they're talking or, or working under D, um, and that would have been hard for Stuart. I think what Lancaster's done is incredible to be able to effectively defend both sides uh, of the ball. Or sorry, coach both sides of the ball. It's very rare now. It's very rare in a professional organization, and and Leinster defense isn't a, a massive weakness. But if you're being hypercritical, you would say, you know, that's an area that they potentially could defend, could could improve upon and bring in a specialist of Nina Barr's uh, ability is is a phenomenal uh, statement, I think. To, to move it on to the game at the weekend, Birch, Leinster, three-point winners against the Lions and like this whole tour has been such a brilliant opportunity for, for Leinster squad with a, a 
pretty young group of players to be able to head down and play a risk a risk free couple of games that you know don't have any major consequences on the table, and we're seeing that now extending to the coaching team where Leo Cullen has returned home and Sean O'Brien is is leading the team for the week. But for such an inexperienced group of players, showed an enormous amount of battle in Johannesburg on on Saturday to come from behind and grind out that win in the manner that they did. Yeah, it was, it was phenomenal, and, and you know I thought her down out when they had those two yellow cards. You could have forgiven him, you know, altitude, um, having very little time together. Um, some guys getting their first cap and they just showed whatever whatever team wears blue at the moment, you know, thinking back to the Ulster game where Ulster were coasting and Leicester got a red card. Leicester came back and pulled away. The Stormers game where they were 20 points down, came back and got the draw without a lot of their frontline guys. And then this team, which was even weaker on paper, um, to come back and, and show that. And I think it's massive for them. I think it's massive for their development. But also, if there's a URC trophy to be given out at the end of the year, you know, they play their part now and they, they may have played their part in keeping Leinster unbeaten. If, obviously, it's a tougher ask in, in Pretoria um, this weekend. But if they can go there and, and not lose and Leinster go and win, you know, the URC unbeaten um or, or win the double and have an unbeaten season, that's a, a phenomenal uh team to be part of. Um and they've played a role in it. You know, it's one thing getting picked to play a URC match, but actually be part of a team who win, um, particularly in those circumstances is, is massive. And uh yeah, it just shows you that there's incredible depth to, to that squad and uh yeah, the coaching side of it, you know, Sean O'Brien to get a chance to, to be head coach this week. You know, Simon Broughton, who's the academy manager, is over there. He's He's part of the coaching group. Um, it is a valuable experience for for them as well, just to to taste, you know, what what leading a team is in in a in a difficult URC game away from home. And Keats on on the out half, Sam Prendergast debut. Leo Cullen has been pleading caution that we don't get too carried away about about this fella. I'm let's just get carried away. Why not? It probably didn't help the the hype train that he ends up kicking the winning points in the last couple of minutes as well. No, uh, I've been watching him with with the under twenties as well. He's he's a cool, calm customer. And listen, he has everything that you want. He's a he's, he's a very good passer of the ball. He's 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 a he's a big guy, uh, quite tall. I'm sure they'll 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 look to put a bit a bit more meat on him defending in that channel. But uh, he's got a great kicking game, a great game understanding, and he's he is like he, he's exciting to watch. As I said, I know why Leo doesn't want to put too much pressure on him because he's he's. He's playing some great stuff at at the at the moment, and like he could he could be with the way the the ten situation at the moment is going, he could be a, a late bolter for, for for the for the World Cup. Like you 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 wouldn't is that just pushing it in there? Is it? <laughs> That's our headline sorted for the top of this. <laughs> he, he, he honestly he, he could be like he's he's the player he's probably a 10 in form like obviously you, you still have your sex and you got Ross Byrne there's still Jack Crowley um, obviously Ben's gone you've got Joey who's is still in contention but then who's after that it, it looks like it's 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 Sam and I, I wouldn't be surprised if they bring him in for the for the, the for the summer uh, get a bit of experience there and whether he goes or whether he doesn't go it's going to be a great experience for him he's he's a uh, he, he's actually a really enjoyable player to watch. He's so calm, calm on the ball, and he's he's still moving forward. But he just looks very like Dan Carter. Like it looks like he has so much time on the ball, and he's he's very good at picking picking out good passes. I just compare him to Dan, Dan Carter there as yeah. well. There's your second. <laughs> there's your second headline tomorrow. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, he's a, listen. He's he's a very good young player. Yeah. He, he's still rusty in a few, few little things, uh, but he's 19, 20. He's, he's got time and he's probably in the best place to develop that under Sexton for the last few, few weeks of his career. Yeah. And Birch, like, you know, all joking aside and stuff, it, it just was very nice. Even if Leinster didn't win at the weekend, it was nice to see that he brought the same attitude and kind of, I, I'd say cockiness in a good way to the position that he had a, a few weeks ago playing with the Ireland under 20s that he has the bit of a had the bit of a swagger and it wasn't a case of stepping up into a Leinster senior jersey and deciding okay now I need to I, I need to start playing a bit more cautiously or be a bit more responsible things like that he still looked like he had the same level of confidence about him yeah and I, I think Leo Leo doesn't get excited on Christmas Eve you know what I mean he, he he's the most calm 
uh, guy ever, and that's why he's so good, and that's why he he's uh, his longevity is um, is to be admired. He just he just sees you know steady, steady, steady. I, I think privately he has to be getting excited uh, about Sam. Um, it's the the hype is going to build regardless of what what any of us want to do because when he plays, people can see him. And I actually had a I was on a panel yesterday with Ruby Walsh and. He said to me, "Oh, he has to go to the World Cup," and I was like, "No, he won't." And he couldn't understand why he won't go to the World Cup. And and um, his argument was, he, you know, Ruby himself won a Ch- Punchestown Gold Cup at nineteen. Michael Sullivan, you know, has had a couple of big winners in Cheltenham because someone saw the talent he has and just let him lose. But I think timing for Sam is going to be difficult for the World Cup because, uh, you know, after this weekend, you know, Ross Byrne is going to play um, nearly all the rest of the games, and Harry. He's probably going to be on the bench. Uh, and then Frawley's also there. So unless someone gets injured, he may not get the high-profile game over the next five weeks that's going to give him that chance. Will Farrell bring him in for the summer? Yeah, possibly. But geez, it'll be a big call. It'll be a big call to, to bring him to a World Cup. I think if you know if it was three or four months earlier, he could go. But I, I've said this. I, I saw Sam in school. Um, and like during my time watching schools, Ruby, since when I played the same year as Dennis Hickey, Dennis Hickey was clearly going to play for Ireland. You know, uh, Gordon Darcy was clearly going to play for Ireland. Rob Kearney, Dan Levy, Luke McGrath in school. And Sam Prendergast, you know, uh, when he played Newbridge as a fifth year, there was no cup as a sixth year. Um, like he led Newbridge to a final. Um, wasn't played. The final was played because of COVID. But for me, he's you can see all the things then that you can see now, a calmness, a game understanding, a drive um, and a skill set that's, you know, you would say well, he would play for Ireland. So I don't doubt he play for Ireland. I just wonder, I wonder, can it happen in time, to be honest? Uh, you know, it'd uh, be a massive call. I think he's going to need an injury to get into that Ireland squad. But certainly he's the same as Joey. Once Ross has gone to the World Cup, Johnny's gone to the World Cup, mm. he'll be looking to start at URC, fighting it out with Harry Byrne, Charlie Tector, um, to try and make sure this time next year, he's in, you know, he's had a Six Nations campaign of some description. I was yeah. talking about the under twenties World Cup. <laughs> yeah, go you know, back track now. You know, you're gonna take some measures off, Leo. Shut up, shut up. <laughs> like I do. <laughs> All right, that is Bulls against Leicester, three o'clock on a on Saturday afternoon. We'll move on to Connacht now. Thirty eight nineteen winners against Cardiff at the weekend. Um, Keats, they did what they set out to do. They're into the playoffs at the very least. They're on forty nine points. Bulls are back on forty eight. Sharks are on forty six. So. There's still a lot of um jockeying around for position for Champions Cup places. Away to Glasgow on paper looks like a pretty tough game to to be going and looking for, for a win. But when you kind of look at everything, Glasgow are pretty much locked into fourth place. They they need a miracle if they were to, to get up to third and Munster back in fifth can't catch them. So there is a possibility that Glasgow could be resting a few key players ahead of a, a quarter final in a couple of weeks' time. My reading on, on Connacht and Glasgow at the weekend, I don't really know how to make a call on it until I actually see the teams named on, on Friday afternoon and see what we're looking with. Uh, I, I think when, when you said there at the, the quarter final will be in probably a few weeks' time. So I don't I don't think I don't think two Glasgow weeks. Yeah, two weeks. Two weeks. Oh, so it's the week after, is it? No, it'll be so next weekend. You've got the Champions Cup and Challenge Cup semi final. Yeah, yeah. Well, also, sorry, Glasgow are going to have a, a Challenge Cup semi final the following week as well. You know, next weekend and then a quarter final the week after. So, look, there's the possibility they could be resting players this weekend. Yeah, it is a fair point, but I just don't think Glasgow have been playing well enough all throughout the season to kind of afford that. I think they're on a, a good, rich run, uh, run of fame. Uh, form now and I think they want to keep building on that so I don't think they'll be they'll, they'll be changing much they'll, they'll still want to win at home at um is it their last home game of the season more like well last le- league game they want to put on a good performance well they'll have a home quarter final home quarter final yeah <laughs> against Munster um, <laughs> more likely so I I think I don't think they'll change I think they'll go strong um I think they'll they'll be a bit they're a different animal there in Scotland. I'm sure I, I played there for for six months, and I I know what they're 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 very similar to the Irish. They're they're a passionate group of lads, and they they will want to to put on a good performance against uh, Connacht leading into these the 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 cup rugby the 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 
the last quarterfinals, final or semi-finals. This is knockout rugby now, so I don't think they'll be changing much. And I think they they'll be a bit too strong for for Connacht. And um, chatting to Stafford McDowell, who who's one there, he's he's obviously you've got um the the twelve and thirteen combination for Scotland and and Staff. He's actually just outside that, that centre partnership, but whenever he's in, he's captain. So he he's talking about like there's great confidence in that group. They're they're striving. They they they're thinking about silverware this season. Even though you probably wouldn't have contended them contended them, but they 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 feel like they're playing well enough to to cause a few upsets when it gets into the quarterfinal semi final stages. So all in all, Birch has got the makings of a really good game like you've two sides there who like to play some some really nice rugby on a on a good fast hard track in Scotson. yeah another 4G pitch and I, I, I really will enjoy watching Glasgow play obviously Nigel Carlin uh, the former Connor coaches there but Franco Smith's come in and um, they had a difficult year under Danny Wilson but, you know obviously they played some great rugby under Gregor Townsend back in the day when they won it then under Dave Rennie but they just had lost a little bit of confidence in form, but they're right back up there now, and uh, they're 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 genuine contenders for this for this trophy. You know, I I, I obviously you've got a home advantage in the playoffs, and uh, on their day they can probably beat anybody. They have um, a very very strong side as on paper, and but on the on the pitch at the moment, Edinburgh have a strong side on paper, but have been pretty mm-hmm. poor, and and um, obviously they're going to look at a change of management, but. Um, Tough game for Connacht, but they got what they needed last weekend, and uh, were quite impressed. I thought against uh, against Cardiff, um, and how they how they took them apart. Yeah, and you were there at the sports ground on Saturday, and just seemed like kind of an all round enjoyable evening. Like you'd a nice atmosphere with Andy Friend's last home game, departing players getting a good send off. the The internationals were all out there. Bondiaki looked to be back to his best. Caelan Blade was was outstanding again. Regardless of where the the season goes, it seems like it it is finishing with Connacht heading on an upward curve. Yeah, look, they weren't in the Champions Cup this year, so if, if Andy Friend's legacy can be getting him back into the Champions Cup, having blooded you know a lot of the young talent, the two Murray brothers, um, you know, Carl Ford we mentioned, Kit Gannon, uh, or McNulty, um, young Divine, look, there's youngsters coming through that academy, Dylan Tierney Martin, um. They they will have a squad, you know, that that hopefully can can go and be competitive in the Champions Cup and, and make that year and year and year achievement. And obviously new stadium coming, new coaching staff, you know, um obviously Muldoon coming back. Um, you know, Wilkins knows what's there. So hopefully there won't be a big betting in period. Um obviously Scott Fardy coming in as defense coach. And that was an area that they probably needed um, you know, to, to look at because they will they can be quite poor defensively on, uh, when they're not on. So yeah, it's 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 positive for Connacht. I think them getting into the Cha- Champions Cup is a, is a very good achievement by by friend and and the the coaching and playing group. Yeah, and they'll be the the last team out on on Saturday evening. So at the very least, they're going to know what they'll need to do to get a a top six finish at the very least, uh, Keats. But on Scott Fardy, Birch mentioned him there. That was a a bit of a bolt out of the blue on on Monday. Maybe not to the the same extent that. Uh, Jacques Nienarber to Leinster was, but it's a it's a really interesting appointment for Connacht and Kay Fardy doesn't have a huge amount of coaching experience so far, but I think everything we've heard so far is is quite positive on him. And obviously he knows the the lay of the land in Ireland. And I think also as well, what's probably you know not the most important thing in the world, but relatively important is that it's a it's a high profile name. It's it's an exciting appointment. Yeah, uh, along with John Muldoon, um, I say that's something that the players can really get excited about and and look forward to 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 next season. Um, obviously, I don't know too much about Scott Scott Fardy as a as a coach, but as a player, like he was, he he was an enforcer on the pitch. He was a leader, and to to have someone like that coming into your defensive setup is is, is probably what what you want. So it'll be interesting to see how he goes. As you said, there it's a high profile name. And uh, it's going to get the players excited for 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 the upcoming season, uh, for for next season, which will stimulate them for the rest of this season, and and hopefully they can go on a, a late run. But um, yeah, it, it's exciting times. And as I said, we were probably talking around Christmas time about UL Bows. I don't don't think Connacht would have thought that they'd be getting into this position where they were around that time. So it's a, a great turnaround for them. They've put in some good performances, and uh, it was a great performance in the weekend, and it was great to see. 
uh, Bundy back uh, playing and setting up tries, offloading tries to to Mac Hansen and and Marmion getting a, a final try on his on his send off. It was it was a bit of a party atmosphere in, in Connacht on on the weekend, so it was good to see. Yeah, and Bert on Bundyaki, like we've said it so many times, but they do just tick differently when Bundyaki's on form, don't they? Yeah, and it was I thought it was really important. He was poor against Ed Bennett on the week before. Uh, the team are poor, and obviously there's been lots of rumours about him, but I just thought that game um, hopefully just puts it all to bed. He's back in the team. He played well. You could um, see from the first couple of minutes like he was properly dialed in and, and psyched yeah. up for it. Like, yeah, and, and like, look, just the, the body language and the way he was reacting to, to incidents and moments in the game. Like the whole, the sports ground just lifts when he's when he's on form. Massive, and it would be a terrible way for him. It would be terrible if it didn't finish property firm whenever it does finish that he has that you know proper send off because he's been immense for Connacht and like his form in that Arlington game was outrageously good and I thought we saw at the weekend uh, him getting back to that for Connacht and he will be a key man for them in the in the playoffs and uh, a key man for Pete Wilkins as well you know a happy Bundy um, is is important for uh, for Connacht to build a team around him and just to go back to yourself Birch, on, on Scott Fardy I know he's coming in doing defence, but between himself, John Muldoon, and Collie Tucker, if Connacht don't have a pack that are humming next season, I'm going to be seriously disappointed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I I got to know him a little bit when he was over here with Leinster. Um, I think he added to Leinster off the field. You know, he had strong opinions on how the game was played. He's gone back to Japan and got some experience. He says, "Our, he, you know, he says he hasn't really settled from being out of Ireland, and I think that's a great opportunity for him um, to go in with some young coaches." all trying to make a name for themselves, all developing, but all have good experience in their own right. And uh, yeah, I, I think he's going to give Connacht that edge, you know, both um, in terms of the line-out, Maul, D, etc., which he was very good at himself, plus defensively, obviously, in terms of physicality and um, being a hard team to break down. So on paper, it's a, it's a very, very positive uh, recruit. Yeah, it's Looking really interesting. Finally, then Ulster forty nineteen winners against the Dragons on Friday night, taking on Edinburgh at home. Uh, this Friday again, they know a win and they're going to have second place and home advantage right up to a to a semi final if they get there. But but Keats, after such a such an up and down season and so much um so much going on, Ulster potentially found themselves in a position where second place is back in their own hands again. Yeah, exactly, and uh, we we discussed already. They're playing Edinburgh, who are a bit out of form. They're probably their their last. Uh, well, they're playing in in Ravenhill, um, in the Kingspan. So exactly, it's so we we talked about Ulster, uh, their start of the season and how good it was, and then they 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 did that loss to to Leinster when it was it was in their hands and they lost and went in a a, a bad rich bad form. And everyone was riding them off, saying, "Oh no, they've lost a thing." And now they're still finishing second. And I think at the start of the season, if you said to Ulster, "You'd be finishing second behind Leinster," um, anyone like if you said that to any team, you'd be like, "You'd be finishing second in the league behind Leinster." Everyone would have said, "Yep, yeah, I'll take that," because of uh, because of how good Leinster are, and like it just shows that we shouldn't judge. Like uh, every team goes through little rough patches throughout the season, well, except for Leinster, but. Um, it just shows that, like, just be patient. Um, they they got their form back. They still probably weren't as good as they were at the start of the season, where we were actually talking about them as being real title contenders, and this could be their year. And um, but they are where they want to be. They're second. They're, they're, they're obviously, I think, going to finish second. I think they'll beat Edinburgh on, on the weekend. And who knows when you have a, a home quarterfinal, semi final? It's it, it's it's on the day. And Tom Stewart, the Troy Machine, seventeen in all competitions. Birch, Birch, sixteen in the URC. He's uh, how many? How many is, is he going to finish with by the end of Friday night? Jesus, um, he probably he's got another one for sure. He's uh, look at it, he, he's behind a very good Ulster Mall, but he is very, very dangerous. He's a very good player. I know Farrell has obviously brought him into the Irish squad. Um, with Herring and him in particular, they have uh, two excellent hookers and. Uh, He's one. He's just been a lucky with obviously the age profile of Dan Sheen and, and Ronan Kelleher, but um, he's going to be putting his hand up. I think in an Ulster jersey and an Irish jersey for quite a while. Yeah. So that is Ulster and Dragons seven thirty five on Friday evening, and that caps us off for the the URC regular season. We'll be uh, back in the the podcast next week 
uh, looking back in these games and ahead at the, the Heineken Champions Cup semi-final between Leinster and Toulouse next week. A reminder as well, we'll have another podcast this evening. Michael Glennon chatting to Irish women's pair Sam Monnan and Linda Dugang. But uh, from now on the podcast, Keith, thanks a million and best of luck this weekend. Yeah, thanks, and Birch, all the best. Cheers, guys.